This evening, once again, we have with us uh, Professor Roy Amar, and uh, we also have, I think, uh, some of you who are not uh, familiar with uh, uh, Mr. Alex Robertson, yeah? and uh, who has been with us here throughout the Novice program. And uh, last night, Professor Amor from the University of uh, Windsor in Ontario, Canada. Last night he presented us with a lecture on the Buddha and Christ. And this evening he will be talking, talking on the subject of the concept of punya or merits. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, this will be his uh, next book. Uh, and he is gathering materials about, uh, he has been gathering materials for some time on uh, visiting various countries on punya. And uh, so without further ado, we shall invite Professor Amor to speak, after which uh, for about an hour and uh, is it for this one? Yeah. Yes, for about an hour, after which uh, we will have a question session. I see more people were interested in Buddha and Christ than they are in making merit. Well, maybe not than in making merit, but in hearing a prop lecture about merit. Yeah. Um, I, I first want to start with a joke on myself that I thought of as I was getting dressed tonight. Um, I have to, con to tell you, to explain this, that I packed in a hurry when I was leaving Singapore. I left, I traveled, so I brought my mother over to Singapore, and I left her there in the hotel, so I didn't, I was only going to bring one suitcase on my trip to Bangkok, Penang, and back here. And uh, somehow I concentrated too much on picking shirts and not enough on pants because when I, when I got to Bangkok, I found that the only pair of pants I had with me was the one I had on. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem with that is, I mean, the, there have washing machines all every place I've been, including at, at, near the Y, but um, I can't wash them and wear them at the same time. <laughs> so, as a result, these pants get dirtier and more and more wrinkled, and I'm getting very tired of wearing them. So, as I was getting dressed and putting on, you know, clean myself and clean, put on a clean shirt and everything, and then the same old wrinkled, dirty pants, I, I thought of a, you know, a Buddhist joke, so to speak, on my cell. I thought, you know, traditionally in Theravada, there are two, everything is impermanent except for two things that are forever, you know, empty space and nirvana. Well, I thought every, and, and now I think everything is, is permanent except, uh, I mean, everything is impermanent except empty space, nirvana, and my gray pants. <laughs> They're feeling pretty permanent to me. Right? Um, I have also one, one uh, more comment before I start talking about merit. There was a leftover from last night. Um, someone afterwards said, why don't we talk about soul in the comparison of Buddha uh, and Christ, right? And that seemed like a good question to me. Why didn't I talk about the soul? <laughs> uh, that's obviously an important thing. And uh, so I thank the question. I don't remember who it was now, but thanks for uh, reminding me that that was an important ingredient that should have been discussed. And uh, uh, let's, let me make a couple of quick comments about it. Um, there's at least two... Uh, I don't mean contrasting meanings, but two different dimensions, let's say, of anatta in, uh, in Buddhism. Um, and uh, I, I'm not suggesting there's any kind of antagonism between these two. I see, on the contrary, a continuity. 
but just when it term, in terms of comparing it with Christianity, it's a helpful distinction for me to talk about two different dimensions of it, because one of these dimensions is has something very similar in Christianity, and one of them is completely different than Christianity. Right? One dimension of uh, Buddhist anatta is uh, the uh, like realized in vipassana, where you 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 develop uh, you get beyond egoness. Right? Uh, in Sanskrit, there's a, a lovely term for ego called ahamkara. Like the eye maker, it literally means that which makes I, right, or I-ness. Um, so through Buddhist wisdom, meditation, vipassana, uh, and mindfulness, uh, we can come to a state where we uh, get rid of uh, uh, absolutizing that I-ness, and we can get into a state of mindfulness where our own uh, ego concerns are not dominating us, right? That, the Christians have a similar thing. They don't call it no self, but they also uh, strive to get beyond their own personal uh, wishes, desires. Uh, they call it... Uh, in the words of uh, St. Paul in the Bible, uh, having the mind of Christ in you, or on the next page or two, Paul will say, being in Christ. Um, and it, Paul says, it's not I, but Christ that says this, right? It, it's a little bit like in Zen Buddhism where they have their way of talking about anatta, where they say that, you know, the eye drops away and the mind of the patriarch uh, blossoms, comes to the surface, right? Uh, so my point is that in, in both Christianity and Buddhism, there is a sense of which you get beyond selfness in that, in that lesser sense, right? Now, the other dimension of anatta doctrine is the may be best translated into English as no soul, as opposed to the other di first dimension I was translating as selflessness, right? Or, uh, the no soul is in contrast with the Christian notion of it, an eternal soul. And, I mean, I'm sure that's no surprise to any of you <laughs> to know that. I mean, everybody realizes, I think, could study the two religions at all, that that is a major difference in their um, thought, right? And that's uh, what I wanted to add on soul. Uh, if somebody wants to uh, press the issue further during the questions, uh, that's fine. Now I turn to uh, merit. Uh, let me explain a little bit about uh, how I got interested in the topic in the first place, sometimes it's sort of humanizing these things makes it a little more interesting, right? Um, when I was in graduate school, um, the one of the uh, terrors that hits you when you're in a, a, a PhD level program is that you know that sooner or later you have to come up with some topic, something that you can write on as a dissertation that no one else has ever written on, at least not ever done in the, in the way you're going to do it, right? And uh, that's very scary uh, to think that you've got to, to think of some topic. And some uh, lucky PhD students have a prof who just says, well, you know, here, work on this, right? <laughs> and it takes all that. But my prof wasn't like that. Um, and uh, he worked on Tibetan Buddhism, and I wanted to work on Theravada Buddhism, so, uh, you know, I was on my own to think, of, think up a topic, and that was the background, and then in the foreground was, uh, I, I, almost every book I read on uh, Buddhism in general, but especially on Theravada and contemporary Theravada, talked about making merit, and I had studied Thai, and I realized that in Thai, the word for festival was Tambun, uh, which is their way of saying uh, making punya. You know, some of you may know Thai, you know, uh, 
Kunya is the Sanskrit or Pali word for uh, merit, and it comes out, it gets shortened in Thai to Pun. So here they were calling every festival they had Tambun. And, and I, so I thought, well, I better learn more about this making merit. So I started looking for some helpful book or article or section of a book or something that would give me some you know, reasonable explanation or discussion of m making merit. And it was very difficult to find this thing. So I looked, I didn't look constantly, but you know, I, off and on for uh, several months, I looked for that kind of thing. And then one day, I had one of those bong <laughs> wake up moments, right? A little mini enlightenment of, of, a, of a sort where you think, wait a minute, that's my dissertation topic, right? <laughs> I'll, write, I'll write that, right? So uh, I ran that by my uh, director, my main teacher, and he said, well, why do I want to work on Pali Buddhism anyway? Uh, why don't I work on this Tibetan stuff? And I said, well, I want to work on the Pali Buddhism. And he said, well, fine. And if that's what you want to do, it's okay with me. I mean, he wasn't very supportive, but on the other hand, he, he did say it was all right. So I proceeded to do uh, that. And I originally said, well, I, I, I want to do it on the merit, the understanding of merit in the texts and the Pali Canon. And then I want to do like historical developments of it. And then I want to do how it comes out in contemporary Buddhist countries, like maybe Sri Lanka and Thailand. And he said, well, that sounds really nice for a book sometime, but it's too much for a dissertation. Just stick with the Pali Canon for now, right? So that's what I, that was very good advice, by the way. Uh, and I, so I just stuck with, with that, with the intention of writing the Fuller book someday. And that was uh, 18 years ago. <laughs> and uh, now I'm finally, and in, the, in that whole 18 years, I've always had the idea of doing this, and I've talked to people, and I've gotten help, and i found some things that are more helpful in explaining um, this, and I've asked people a lot of questions in virtually every Buddhist country in the world at this point, except Korea. I've never been to Korea. Um, and now I feel like I'm getting closer to being ready to uh, put a period to it, and I've been trying to draft some of the chapters. So what I want to do tonight is to hit some of the high points. Uh, hopefully the book has some high points. <laughs> Uh, make some of the points in quick fashion that I'm going to make in a more boring, longer way in the book itself. Right? Uh, and this talk is organized into uh, three sections. The first one is uh, on merit in the Pali Canon, in the Tabhidika. The second section is on merit in contemporary Theravada practice. Right? And the third section is on merit uh, in uh, some other Buddhist traditions, uh, uh, namely Pure Land and Zen. Right? Now, um, there isn't going to be a time to go into a lot of depth on any one of these things. What I want to try to do is uh, sort of outline the thing for you. Right. And now, last night I was talking uh, as a Christian, and you noticed that I was, uh, you know, I speak my mind on these things, and I didn't always agree with the Christian tradition, and I didn't uh, hesitate to say so, but I was also trying to be very careful to let you know when I thought I was giving you the sort of uh, official Christian answer, and when I was giving you my own opinions of these things, right? Now, tonight I'm talking to you as a Buddhist. Uh, and last night I didn't go pay respect to the Buddha before I talked. Tonight I did, right? Uh, and last night I was frank about Christianity and some of its strengths and weaknesses. Tonight I'm going to be frank about Buddhism, some of its strengths and weaknesses. Somebody doesn't want that, I'm warning you now. You, you know, pretend you need to go to the, get a drink and leave if you want to, right? 
sure I'll take it hard, but I'll understand it. No, I, when I get to the contemporary things, I'm going to say what I think is good and what I think is bad about merit practices today. And I mean, I paid a lot of money to come over here uh, to talk to you, and uh, my gracious hosts here are, are paying my board and room and, and putting a lot of their time into being so nice to me. And presumably, the idea is for me to speak the truth as I see it, right? So uh, here goes. We, first place, a, a lot of Buddhists don't know enough about the rise of Buddhism in, in India. Now, you know, the scholar monks that are here as your leaders know these things. Uh, but uh, a lot of ordinary Buddhists and a lot of ordinary Buddhist monks uh, don't really know very much about the history and the the social conditions and things and the rise of early Buddhism. So this first part of the talk is I'm going to try to uh, give you my sort of historian's view of what went on there and how merit uh, relates to it. The situation was this. The Ganges River Basin was where it was at for spiritual discussions in the 6th century BC. Now, if you want to be a famous movie maker, uh, you're probably going to need to go to Hollywood if you're going to write and that sort of thing. Uh, that's where it's at. If not there, at least to Bombay or you know some tradition. And sooner or later, you're going to have to try your films out at the famous festival in Cannes. Uh, you know, France. I mean, that's sort of where it's at. That's where the, the elite of the world's filmmakers meet, right? In Buddha's day, along the Ganges River was the elite of where religious ideas were meeting. And I say that very carefully. I don't mean that uh, it was the elite in the West, whereas Athens, I mean in the East, whereas Athens was in the West. I mean the best place in the world you could have been to get into some heated discussions of Dharma was along the Ganges, if that's when you lived. My philosophy professor, when I was an undergraduate, uh, who got me started in comparative religion, he used to say that if someone granted him uh, this kind of condition if they said, okay, you can be reborn in your next life in any past century. You choose where and when you want to be born. He said, I wouldn't even have to give it a moment's thought. Sixth century BC India. I want to go sit there when Buddha and Mahavira the Jain and uh, Gosala and a lot, a lot of the Brahmins who uh, authored parts of the Upanishads, I want to be there. That's where it was, right? That's what was going on in that time. Now, that meant that there was a lot of competition. You think there's a lot of religious competition in Malaysia right now? Uh, you know, it's nothing compared to what they were doing. In, now, that's one background comment. The next background comment has to do with karma. Everybody, almost everybody believed in karma. There was one school of thought, one, set, one teacher and his disciples uh, that, we, that are, uh, we call now the materialists. They did not believe in karma. And they were really uh, uh, forceful in their, in their illustrations. This one man said, you could go up one side of the Ganges River, or like walk along the one bank of the Ganges River and kill people and kick dogs and, you know, do all kinds of, of uh, harmful things, and it isn't going to affect your life one bit. Or you could go along the other side of the Ganges and give things to uh, worthy teachers, um, help poor people, um, you know, heal the sick, 
and you know, do all these good things isn't going to make one bit of difference. If you're going to die at age 33, you're still going to die at age 33, you know. In other words, he, he, this teacher radically denied karma. Uh, and he was saying, you know, you can do criminal things, and as long as you're not caught, uh, you know, it isn't, there isn't going to be any karma result. There's no karma vipaka. Right? Now, all the other teachers believed in karma. They had only minor disputes. They, they argued karma a lot, but they were all arguing as believers, right? It was like, oh, well, karma works for over a maximum of seven generations. Some people said that. Others said, no, no, it could, it could be as many as a hundred lives from now. By seven generations, I mean seven rebirths, right? The regeneration of, uh, uh, of your karmic system. So they argued about the fine points, right? But they all accepted it, including Buddha. Buddha did not invent a karma system. He just gave his interpretation of it, right? Now, that was background item number two. Background item number three it has to do with merit making. And to understand what karma meant for them and merit making meant for them, we have to get into the psychology of defilement. Not just in India, but all around the world, in the archaic level, level of human consciousness. In other words, if you go really, really far back into stories and texts, people were afraid of defiling themselves. They believed that if you did certain things, you brought defilement on yourself. And there were a lot of Indians who really took this seriously in the time of the Buddha. And so, bad karma, papa karma, right, defiled you. It tainted your soul. And good karma, punya karma, uh, cleansed, partially cleansed the soul. So it was a matter of trying to purify your soul, your deep self. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about Buddhism here, so it's not like I'm forgetting that Buddhism has a not to doctrine. I'm talking about the general teachings of the time, right, of these other people that believed in karma. Now, you notice I was using punya, this, the Sanskrit and Pali word for merit. It's spelled a little differently in Sanskrit and Pali, but it comes out almost the same. I would, that word punya uh, is, in effect, an adjective modifying karma in most of the early texts. Punya, or merit, means meritorious karma. Okay? And papa, or apunya, means demeritorious karma. And originally it meant that which tends to defile you or that which tends to purify you. Now, there was another set of terms that were used by all these teachers. And uh, the positive term is kusala, K-U-S-A-L-A. -A. This one is not quite so well known. And the, posit uh, the negative term is akusala. Right? Um, it took me a while to catch on to what the Thais were saying when I was talking, interviewing them about this, because they call kusala gosan. And I didn't know what gosan was for a while. Um, in Burmese, it comes out kuto, uh, or something like that. I don't, uh, you know, there's these different uh, ways of pronouncing the word. Kusala is short for kusala chitta, or akusala chitta. And so it's punya karma kusala chitta. If you remember that, you're, you're well on the way of understanding these early things. To talk about punya means uh, good karma. To talk about kusala means good mind, right? That you're, you're doing. Now these two things go together. They're almost synonyms, if you see what I mean. Uh, because one way of talking talks, uh, emphasize, if you say punya, you're talking about the karmic uh, result or the karmic creation. If you say chitta uh, or kusala, kusala, you're talking about the state of mind that's associated with that, right? Now, this brings me to one of Buddha's reforms. 
Buddha, the fine point he put on it, one of them was, that there's no such thing as making merit or doing a punya karma thing unless there's a wholesome chitta involved. Now, you can find among some of the stories of the other sects and of, in Hinduism, you can find stories about what I would call the accidental making of merit. Somebody kind of lucks into it, right? They're, they're walking down a road and they, uh, they, they, see, so they have something and they, they sort of throw it away and then along comes a Brahmin, and it's just what that Brahmin needs, and he picks it up and uses it, and therefore the person who threw something away thoughtlessly makes great merit. Uh, you know, sort of, that's what I mean by accidental merit. Buddhists never believed in it. I had never found one single story where somebody makes merit, in a, one single Buddhist story, without having a mind, right? Now, sometimes people make merit sort of luckily like, in, in, in other words, maybe they, they set out on a road and uh, they didn't, you know, they weren't planning to go participate in what the Thai call a tambun, right? Uh, they were just walking down the road and, uh, you know, they have some food with them uh, that they were about to eat and, oh, look, there's a monk. Oh, you know, I guess, you know, gee, maybe I should just offer my food to, to the monk and they do, and they want to make great merit. I mean, you don't necessarily have to have planned it out ahead of time, right? Uh, but at the time that they do it, they, they had a wholesome mind, a kusala chitta. They had the idea of doing it, right, the intention. You know, uh, I used to be married, and when I remember at my wedding, we, you know, the, I assume that something similar is done here. The, the, the night before the wedding, there's a rehearsal, right? And in the rehearsal, there's my bride-to-be and I, and we're, we're walking down the aisle, and the, the wedding, rest of the wedding party's there. There's no audience, you know, but the rest of the wedding party's there. And we walk down, and, the, and we practice all of the things. We say exactly the whole thing, right? The whole thing, and then the minister says, and now I pronounce you man and wife, and all this. And I said, wait a minute. If we just did all that, why are we not married now, right? <laughs> and uh, I've always been the kind of person that asks questions. <laughs> and he's, and the, the minister explained, he said, well, because this, the intention of getting married wasn't involved here. We didn't have to put it in this way. Our chitta was not set on, we thought this was practice, we didn't think of this as the, as the real ritual, right? Uh, it's what in, uh, I didn't know it at that time, I later learned that there's a long history in Christian uh, thought of this, it was called in Latin intentio, which just means what in modern English is intention, right? So you have to have the right intention. Well, that's what Buddhists did about making merit, there's no such thing as just you know, making merit when you don't have the right intention. Your mind has to be completely in it. That was one of Buddha's uh, fine points on merit theory, and it continues right to the present day in, in all of the Buddhist traditions, as far as I, that's my understanding. Now, the next of Buddha's, uh, the, the next point I want to make is related to what I call the merit field formula. Now, I just made up that term, but I didn't make up the formula. It's what you're familiar with uh, on page 19 of your Handbook of, of, uh, Handbook of Buddhists by uh, uh, your chief abbot, um, where it's in the uh, homage to the uh, Sangha where uh, you we're told uh, that this uh, Bhagavato, Savaka Sango, Ahunio, Pahunio, Dakineo, Anjali, Karaniyo, Anutram, Punya, Ketam, Loka, Sati. Now, um, what I want to do is go through that a little bit and help you know what that means. I mean, you, I, I know you know that. You've been reciting that all your life. Uh, but did you ever really think about what it means? 
Uh, if you haven't, uh, you're going to right now. Uh, I mean, the first part is easy. It just means uh, this, uh, this, this uh, uh, Sangha of disciples of the Bhagavato, the Buddha. So that's, we can handle that one really easily, right? Uh, al although some people uh, don't understand uh, that it means uh, the Savako Sangha, a lot of Buddhist monks I've talked to and Buddhist scholars interpret that uh, as, as Sangha in the broadest sense of the term of, you know, of the eight Aryas. The, uh, it's, it's not just uh, bhikkhus. It's, it's a larger understanding. That's, uh, that is uh, my understanding of it. I think that's open to debate within Buddhism, but lots of uh, people whose opinion I respect uh, seem to favor that larger interpretation. Anyway, the next part gets tougher. Ahunio, Pahunio, uh, Dakineo, Anjali, Karanio. All of those ayos on the end are, is a grammatical form, a very unusual grammatical form that means to be worthy of something, right? And Ahunio means uh, to, uh, to be worthy uh, of uh, sacrifice, and the idea here is that in the old days, um, well, let's put it this way. What people were doing was they were uh, making offerings, usually animal sacrificial offerings, uh, to the Hindu gods, right? And as you know, because of Ahimsa principle, Buddha put an end to that. But a great teachers don't just say, you shouldn't do this. If there's something that people have done for a few thousand years in that culture, they, they sort of steer the practice in a different direction, right? So what he's saying is that the, the worthy Sangha is worthy of um, sacrifice, but sacrifice here no longer means cutting up animals, right? Uh, it, so it's a kind of new style sacrifice, and it's a sacrifice where you you give of your uh, of yourself, your allegiance, uh, and and your uh, it might be your money, but your time. It's a it's more of a personal sacrifice. It's like what I was saying last night, where I was suggesting to you that the the successful contemporary religions integrate your everyday ethic with the religious system, right? And this is a way of doing that. Uh, Pahumio means a, a worthy of hospitality. It means, and now here in the, in the days of, of uh, Buddha, uh, they had a tradition in India that if a, a young, well, if any Brahmin, any priestly person was traveling he had a claim on your hospitality for three days. So he could show up. You have to imagine, you know, there's no uh, rest houses in India at that time. The Sheraton and Hilton haven't been built yet. Uh, and these uh, uh, Brahmins are traveling. Uh, maybe Brahmin students, maybe a learned Brahmin scholar, right? They're traveling. They get ready to stay the night they could go to any householder, any, any household, right? And they could just present themselves there. They didn't even have to ask. According to the Dharma Shastra, the, law, the religious law of India, uh, that householder was obligated to welcome them in, to treat them royally, uh, and, uh, and obliged to do that for three days. Now, if they decided to stay more than three days, then they had to start earning their living, like teaching the children or saying rituals or, you know, for three days they were a guest. Um, and what Buddha was saying here is that who's really worthy of this kind of hospitality is not somebody because they were born a Brahmin, but that doesn't just kind of magically make you worthy of hospitality. What makes you worthy of hospitality is your 
uh, that you're working on spiritually purifying yourself, right? It's what he calls a true Brahmin, or in other cases, a pure person, or one who's, who's uh, conquered uh, desires, all these Buddhist terms you're familiar with. Right? Those are the ones that you should take into your house. Those are the ones that you should offer food uh, to, or, or give robes to, or medicines, or whatever, right? So this is, in a, it, to put it in a nutshell, it's a kind of an anti-Hindu saying, right? It, it, it Buddha was, uh, Buddhist system was in competition with these others. Um, where are we? Third one is uh, Dakineyo. Uh, Dakina, or Dakshina, is uh, the offerings that you give to the priest when they come and chant for you. They come by and they chant the Vedas, and then you give the, the people give them offerings, right? Uh, and Buddha is saying again, it's not the Brahmins because they say these old Vedas that they've got memorized. Uh, those are not the ones that are worthy of your offerings. The worthy ones worthy of your offerings are these people who are working on purifying their their minds, right? It's the same kind of thing as the others. And the last one is. Anjali Karaniyo, you know, Anjali, uh, it just means worthy of respect. It, you know, never mind giving respect to the, to the Brahmins, uh, just because they were born in the Brahmin caste, or just because they've memorized a bunch of Vedas that they can mutter, uh, you know, pay your respect to the people uh, who are in the Savaka Sangha. And then this ends with a statement of, of that this Savaka Sangha is the unsurpassed merit field for all the world, right? An Uttaram Punya Ketam Lokasa. Uh, that means that if you're going to plant your Punya Karma seeds somewhere, you'll get the best results if you plant them here, right? Uh, last night, actually, and I didn't get into this because I was getting short on time, but uh, both Buddha and Jesus talk about the different kinds of fields, different qualities of fields, and here we have a slightly different use of this metaphor. Now, Buddha is presumably saying, implying that maybe some offerings given to uh, some of the Jain monks might be okay, but the highest place to do it, the most worthy place, is uh, with his own Savaka Sangha. I'm just checking to see how closely I'm hitting these points. Whistle something, I'll be right with you in a minute. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what kinds of things, according to the uh, Tipitaka, affect the quality uh, uh, of the punya itself. I've already mentioned what in the Pali Canon is the most important thing that affects it, namely the, the recipient, the, the spiritual purity of the recipient. And the highest merit field, according to that list, is uh, you know, the whole collective uh, sangha, all, you know, the, the universal sangha, the sangha of the four quarters, all, all the aryas together. Um, and then it goes down through, you know, individual ones are, are less merit field. And, a, and, a, and, of course, the Buddha is a much higher merit field than, uh, you know, the, than the Sangha or than the disciples. And, you know, it's the sort of, sorts of things you could, uh, could guess. But the principle that runs through the whole thing is the more pure, the better the merit field. Other things, other factors are figuring in. One is the time. We talked last night about how uh, a, at the moment of death, if you have a kusala chitta, a wholesome chitta, that somehow seems to count more. It's even in the text that way, right? That, that, that's very important. So uh, time is a, a factor. Not like the merit field, but, you know, it is a factor. Uh, the amount of the gift is not so much a factor. Interestingly enough, that's not emphasized. A lot of the stories, the gift is very simple. And here I have to tell you something from uh, Zen tradition. I was uh, interviewing Zen monks uh, in Japan, and uh, 
not, uh, you know, at this point, it wasn't like people at training centers, Zen training centers, but these were just ordinary uh, uh, monks. And, uh, you know, I mean, like, uh, like bhikkhus in a, in a village someplace, right? And uh, they, uh, a Japanese woman was translating for me, and the bhikkhu was answering the questions about this. And he got to talking about the amount. And he said, you know, it's not the amount that counts, it's the, the thought behind it, it's the chitta, uh, right? And uh, so it doesn't really matter whether it's a little gift or a big gift. And uh, my translator was translated that, and she was trying her best to quote him just exactly and, and getting in the proper English and everything. And then she leaned over and said to me, knowing he couldn't understand the English anyway, she leaned over and said to me, but that's not what we people think. <laughs> there is a tension in Buddhism and in Christianity. Christians have the same problem, right? Uh, there is one tendency that thinks, well, if you give, uh, as the Japanese say, if you give more, you get more, right? Uh, and there is that tendency to think that if, if you know, if you give a uh, uh, thousand Malaysian dollars to in support of this temple, why, that's going to count more than if you only give uh, ten Malaysian dollars in support of this temple. Um, you know, I think probably what's happened through the years is whenever Buddhists need to raise some money to uh, build a new temple or put a roof on the temple or something, they kind of play up that, uh, if you give more, you get more, right? <laughs> uh, on the other hand, when they're, when they're not in need of a lot of money and they can be uh, more uh, pure about this in a way, they're more likely to say, well, it's, it's really the thought that counts. But both, uh, but it, it's very clear when Buddha talks that uh, uh, it's, you know, it's not the absolute amount. If anything, if the amount counts at all, it's relative to what you have, right? So that the, the poor person who gives uh, a, a little bit, but for them that's a, that's a very uh, heavy gift, right? That counts much more than a rich person who might give a million dollars, but it's only a fraction of what they have, right? It's, it's very clear that it's not an absolute mouth of count. No one can sort of buy their way into wholesome chitta, right? Uh, any more than a Christian can buy their way into heaven by giving uh, a lot to a church. Now, the, uh, I want to summarize what I've been saying so far. In competition with the other teachers and with the Brahmins, Buddha, uh, Buddha taught that the people who followed his dharma and, and who were purifying him themselves that way were the best possible place to make your anjali, your offerings, your sort of spiritual sacrifices, uh, etc., right? He also taught that intention was absolutely essential that you had to have your mind in a wholesome way when you were giving the gift. You could give away a million Singapore dollars, uh, and if your intention is to get publicity, uh, or your intention is just to have everybody see how good you are at giving away, uh, as I understand Buddhism, it doesn't count. Right? You've just blown a million dollars. Right? Well, maybe you got your publicity. I mean, may, maybe you didn't blow it in that way, right? But it's, no, it's like what Bodhidharma told the king, you know? I mean, you're just doing this, in effect, uh, to think of yourself with how good you are and to sort of earn your way into heaven. You really haven't made any merit at all because your chitta isn't kusala, right? It's as simple as that. Now, the effect of that in the creation of Buddhism, as Buddhism became more of a religion and not just one teacher with, you know, I mean, more of an organized religion, institutionalized religion, the effect was a system of reciprocity of giving, where the lay people gave uh, respect, uh, food, uh, robes, medicines, etc., you know, sort of material things and respect to the Sangha. And the Sangha gave teachings 
uh, and uh, guidance and advice and actually, uh, in the early Sangha, at least, uh, probably uh, uh, medical treatment and a lot of other things, as well as education for the children. And, you know, it was, a, it was a give and take. That's a reciprocity of giving is very important in understanding merit. That made it possible for Buddhism to evolve a very... Uh, efficient monastic system. I mean, a system where one of the most crucial distinctions was between ordained and non-ordained, right? Um, as a matter of fact, it got to be so efficient at that distinction that it may have become a problem. Maybe Buddhism had became too monastic, right? And there was, uh, some people think that Buddhism became weak in India uh, in a later century, uh, you know, around 1000 A.D., I mean, around 1500 years after the after the Parinibbana of Buddha, uh, Buddhism pretty well ceased to exist in India, um, and you know, only in, the, in a, a small sense does it exist there now, right? And one reason, it's, no one knows for sure why it uh, lost out in India. But one suggestion has been made is that the, the monasteries became too uh, self-contained, not enough contact with the lay people, uh, you know, it wasn't well enough integrated, right? And I don't know, but that's a possibility. That's one of the suggestions. Something that Buddhism has to guard against is losing that, that reciprocity of giving, the, the exchange. Uh, uh, between the ordained and unordained. Another of the effects of the merit system is that it, it provides the, the motivation, right? Ordinary uh, Buddhists are motivated by merit. Now, in the long run, the goal is nirvana. But in the short run, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, making merit is, is the main motive, and that's true in Buddhism everywhere. Now, before I leave the canon stuff, I want to say, I want to point out something that sometimes get lost. I mean, all, all Buddhist scholarly monks understand this very well. I don't mean gets lost from, uh, from the good Buddhist teachers, but I mean, it, it, most lay people don't seem to understand this very much. The goal of Buddhism involves getting beyond making merit. It's, called, it's getting beyond merit and demerit. That's the way it's said in the text. Right? And what that means is not that you get beyond doing good things, but that your, uh, your mind becomes so purified that you don't uh, any longer generate karma when you're doing good things. Right? I mean, a Buddha can feed a poor person and, or can uh, to do something meritorious, and it doesn't create karma for the Buddha, because that Buddha is beyond karma, beyond merit and demerit. Whereas if an ordinary person does a good thing, the same good thing, it does create karma, right? Uh, that's what it means to be beyond merit and demerit. A lot of the Western people, if I try to teach this, they don't understand it, because uh, Nietzsche translated or talked about being beyond good and evil, and it sort of distorts the whole thing. If you think of merit, if you remember, it really means meritorious karma. And then, what, and then if you understand that uh, the truly enlightened person is beyond making new karma, right, then it makes sense out of saying that you're beyond merit and demerit. It never ever means somehow you don't practice good things, because Buddha, right up to his death, was still practicing good things. Now I come to the contemporary scene. We finally got to part two. You thought I'd never make it, right? Part two. Today, merit remains a very important motive, uh, the most important of the day-to-day -day motives in Buddhism. Punya and Kusala remain almost synonyms, although it's interesting that some Buddhists now, some Buddhist uh, reform writers, 
are almost getting away from the term punya. They're almost at the point where they're saying bad things about punya, like Bodhidharma did years ago, because they're trying to get people away from a, a kind of mechanistic, mechanical, ritual, you know, okay, I went to this merit-making ritual, I put in my time there, therefore I made merit, right? So some Buddhist writers that I read, such as Buddha Dasa in Thailand, so some Buddhist writers that I read, such as Buddha Dasa in Thailand, are, are using, suggesting they're using this word kusala because it refers to the mind, right? As opposed to, to the punya can sound more like the externals of it. Right? And what, I'm, what I try to suggest in the first part is there really is hardly any difference between kusala and, and punya. They're sort of, one describes the mental state while you're doing it, the other describes uh, you know, the karmic uh, being cre karma being created. But if some people are thinking of making merit in too mechanical a way, then that, that leads the Buddhists to use the word kusala for a sort of higher way of making merit, right? Uh, I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea, but I'm just reporting that it's happening. It's one of the things that I find in a few writers. In my opinion, uh, Merit making has become too ritualized, too formalized, too—I uh, don't want to say magical. Uh, that's not the right word, but too mechanical. Maybe is the, is the way I want to say it. Right? Deep, I think Buddhists, we, Buddhists have got to get back to a situation where they they are fully mindful when they're doing a merit making ritual. They need to be fully mindful that. It's their chitta that is, is or is not wholesome in this, right? I mean, just going to the ritual uh, itself is never making anybody any merit, if you see what I mean. You, or to put it another more blunt way, you only make merit if you purify your chitta, right? Uh, and and you, you, can, you do just plain do not make merit, as I understand Buddhist thought, simply by going through the motions of a ritual, uh, no matter how much the ritual costs you. Okay. And that's why Bodhidharma told the King Wu that he made no merit. Okay. Now, some of the problems I see, some other things. Some places... Uh, it's become very difficult for monks to, practice, to, to go out for alms. I think there's going to be a price to pay. When I ask, young, uh, when I ask monks around the world, uh, what attracted you to Buddhism? You know, the most common answer I get, they said, well, when I was young, growing up in the village, I, every morning... The monks would go by for alms, and they had their eyes downcast, and they looked so calm and serene. And I didn't think about it then, but now later I got to thinking, gee, that's the life I want, right? Now, if monks are not going for alms anymore in so many countries, something's got to replace that, right? And I, it, it's possible I can imagine other things replacing it, but I'm just warning us all that something's got to replace that. Something's got to be there so that the young Buddhists, the children, see the, the calmness and the, and the manifestations of the pure mind on, on, a, on a public basis, right? Uh, they've got to see those things and, and sort of participate in, in that consciousness, that is, to make merit, right, in, in order to kind of keep this tradition going. So, you know, it doesn't have to be gold for alms. I mean, there's no magic in that. But it's got to be something. That's what I'm suggesting to you. Now, in some places, the going for alms is becoming just plain corrupt, in my opinion. In Thailand, at, at, the, at the entrance to uh, Lumbini Park in Bangkok uh, earlier this week, I saw monks standing there. They've, quote, gone for our alms, but they're not doing... Uh, in the park, they're, they're just sitting there holding their monks while the people go by them and you know they just find a busy gate to stand next to at the entrance to the park they stand there holding their bowl and uh, people come along and buy food from the vendors uh, who are there 
And uh, then they give it, they put it in the, the alms bowl, and then the per person goes on in the park. The monk takes the food out, wholesales it back to the vendor, who sells it to the next sucker. <laughs> you know, what is this? <laughs> the monk isn't making any good chitta. <laughs> The person isn't. The, the sucker who paid his money for the food, I don't think they got anything out of it. If their mind is right, they would, right? I mean, the corruption of the monk, I, I'm not going to hold that against the person, right? But I think the people know what's going on, and I don't know if their minds... I mean, no, I'm, I don't know. I'm not inside these people's minds. But I don't think that's a very good way of practicing merit on anybody's part, right? If I were a Buddhist in, Buddhist in Bangkok, I would give alms to the monks who are going through the streets, which many of them are, right? I'm talking about just a few, right? Uh, I wouldn't participate with these, uh, these uh, shysters at, at, uh, at the gates. Uh, now, um, I already said I think merit-making has become too ritualistic. Right? I'm not suggesting for a minute that people should stop having the festivals, that should, people should stop... Uh, doing that thing. I'm just suggesting that it has to be more mindful when they're doing it, right? Okay. Um, I think in merit there's too little support for the poor. Now, I, I tell you how I think this got, came about. In the old days in India, these, these disciples of the Buddha were the poor. There isn't a lot of reference to the text of really poor people. India was not overcrowded in the Buddha's day, right? There seems to have been something like full employment, right? It was a flourishing thing. It, those were big cities. I mean, this, this was, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't the India that we know now. It wasn't people sleeping in the streets in Bombay. Uh, uh, it wasn't people living in these shacks that I walked by on the way from the Y, you know? Uh, the poor were uh, the hungry students who were uh, sitting at Buddha's feet and listening from him. Right? Now we're in a little different situation. We've got real poor in the world, as you know, right? Buddhist thinkers need, you know, creative leaders, uh, young people in Buddhism, you need to figure out a way to bring, to use the, the, the punya, the making merit system to get some redistribution of wealth to help the poor, right? That's the challenge. Now, I, 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 there are Buddhists doing this. I mean, it's not like I thought of this all on my own and, and uh, you know, and I'm and unaware of the Buddhists trying to do this. Um, Ari Ratana of uh, Sri Lanka, you, you probably know about him, right? I don't know if you do know about him or not. Uh, raise up your hand if you've ever heard of Sarbodia in, in Sri Lanka. Is that something you know about? Yeah, okay. Um, he, you know, he's a controversial figure, and I, I don't, you know, I don't have time to get into that. I don't pretend to understand all the all the controversies, so I won't, I'm not going to touch that. But the point is, he does some things that are really interesting with merit. He went to a, he, one time his car broke down, and he was uh, so he wound up spending a night in a village that he wasn't planning on spending. Never been to this village before in his life, uh, but he was there, and he and he noticed that there were a lot of poor people in this village, uh, but not everybody was poor by a long shot. And he also noticed that he went to the temple for the evening service, and there was only about four people there. And it was a, you know, a village of two or three hundred. So he thought, you know, maybe I can do some good for this village while I'm here. I mean, I wasn't planning on being here. They didn't invite me here, but maybe I can do something. So, uh, he went to the uh, abbot uh, and he talked to him about it and got his, um, made some suggestions of what he'd like to do and got his approval to do them, right? Good start. Then he, uh, what he asked is permission to talk to the people who came to the service about what could be done about it. And they, they, he suggested a plan, they came up with the idea. The next night, the people who were at the service the first night, and they recruited a few friends, they all 
they made, uh, they got some, uh, uh, some food for offering. You know, the usual things are the bananas and, and the fruit for the offering. Uh, but they went from house to house and they said, we want extra tonight. Uh, and uh, we want, uh, you know, you, you're not, you're not going to bother coming to the temple. Uh, if you're not, why well, at least, uh, you know, put your hands over it here. Uh, and we'll, we'll do that ritual here. You know, we'll do that merit-making ritual here. And, and they said, oh, okay, okay, the people said, sure, you know. And, and, and they said, uh, oh, why don't you just come along? And actually, many of them did. So that, that the first night they tried this, they had like 20 people at the temple in, instead of four or five. And they had a lot of extra food from this, which they then, when, the, when they were going home, after presenting this to the Buddha altar, you know, presenting it to the Sangha, uh, and again, making the merit, they then said, okay, now on your way home, here, you take these bananas, and you take this, and you take this rice, and you give it to whoever you know in your area that could really use the food. And, and then said, and tomorrow night, when, when you give them to them tonight, say, now this, this is food that's been blessed by being uh, offered to the Buddha, now, uh, and you don't have to pay for it, it's a gift, but there is one thing we'd like you to do, we'd like you to come to the service tomorrow night. Uh, but you don't have to. I mean, here's the food. First, first we give you the food, and then we'll invite you to come. So the sixth night, they had about 40 people there, and they had more food than ever, right? So then about that time, he said, okay, uh, I've, I'm going on now. Uh, I, I, you know, I'll leave it to this village to see what it can do. Now, I don't know what to follow. I'd love to know whether the village managed or whether once he left the thing sort of fell apart. Um, but things can be done, right? And things are being done here and there in Buddhism to try to bring together the, the Buddhist motive of, of making merit and respecting the Sangha and the Buddha and the Dharma and making these offerings like Buddhists are trained to do, and at the same time, uh, thinking of, uh, you know, in a metta karuna way, or having compassion on the people for the needs around there. Um, okay. Another problem that we have in Canada and where I am that you don't have here is we don't have monks. I mean, once every three or four months, one comes through. Uh, so we're having to try to work out ways of, of practicing Buddhist, Buddhism and, you know, making merit without having uh, a monk around uh, to, to focus on, right? Uh, so, I mean, I just mentioned that in passing because it's our problem, it's not your problem. You've got a nice temple and so you don't have to worry about that. We do. Another problem, which may not seem like it's related to you, but to me it does. There are no bhikkhunis in the world for the most part anymore. Most countries have lost the bhikkhuni ordination. You know, I mean, there are no nuns. Uh, and the trouble with that is if, here's the way I'm thinking about it, right? If it's only males who are representing the Sangha, it communicates to yet another generation of human beings that males are the only ones that count. And we'll lose the potential of a whole other generation of women, right? So Buddhism needs to get its bhikkhuni ordination system going again, and it's going to have to do it by taking it from one country, bringing it to another. This has been done before. This, you know, the Siam Nikai got started in Ceylon from Thailand. It's been done in Sri Lanka with the bhikkhunis before. It's, I, I suggest it needs to be started again. And that is, uh, that, you know, then they need to play their role in the receiving of Anjali, Dakaneo, etc. When that happens, um, Buddhism will be the better, in my opinion. Other Buddhist traditions in a nutshell, I'm, I'm abusing my time here. Uh, pure land takes on a, a, a more of a theistic faith thing. Uh, it seems to, uh, if you come at it from a Theravada tradition, they seem to be undermining karma by saying the, the, 
the compassion of Avalokiteshvara or Kuan Yin or the the uh, the uh, the pledge of vow of, of salvation taken by Amida Buddha to save all beings will will save anybody who sort of turns to them sincerely, right? It seems like what happened to the need to to work on your karma, you know, bit by bit by bit. Now, Pure Land Buddhists that I talk to don't feel that tension. They feel like they can continue to work on their merit and their karma, even though in their system salvation is by the grace of Amida, right? I mean, it looks like a problem from a Theravada point of view. The Pure Land people don't feel that is a problem. Uh, this is, uh, you know, is in the ongoing dialogue between uh, Theravada Buddhists and Amida Buddhists, these are the kind of issues that need to be discussed, right? You know, fruitfully, can be worked out. I think we're all Buddhists together, and we're the, the, the more we can get to know each other, the better, right? Uh, somebody asked me last night, do I believe that Kuan Yin really exists? Uh, I take this as a very serious question. I didn't want to give a quick answer in a rushed condition to that last night. I promised that I would try to address that tonight. Uh, I feel about Kuan Yin the same way I feel about the Christian God. Uh, I feel that some people have very real experiences of a god or goddess, and they can transform their lives in a very good way. Uh, that's not my personal experience. Um, although when I was younger, I had some experiences like that. So I, I understand them, I appreciate them, uh, I value them. And I think the question, does Kuan Yin exist or does God exist, is a little misleading, a little, a little simple. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's simple-minded to ask a question, but I mean, if I'm really going to address the issue, I want to come at it a little differently than that. Like Buddha was very good about saying, you know, sometimes some questions shouldn't be answered in the form in which they're asked, right? Uh, and this is one of those things where I would use the same approach. What I want to say is that people who have an experience of a saving god or goddess uh, they have a real experience, and it can be a religiously transforming one. So for them, and in that moment, that God is very real. Uh, and it's sort of irrelevant as to whether that God, quote, exists. I mean, it's possible to conceive of a God that exists and is irrelevant to your salvation, if you see what I mean, right? Uh, and so, I, to me, it's not so much does it exist or not, but does this experience, uh, does the puja done to Kuan Yin help you purify your mind? Does it help you, uh, you know, make progress? If it does, then Kuan Yin exists for you, if you see what I mean. And if Kuan Yin exists for you, then Kuan Yin exists in, in that sense, right? for all Buddhists. Okay. I, I, you know, if, if for somebody who wants to hear, yes, Kuan Yin exists, that's going to be a very unsatisfied answer, satisfactory answer. But it's my answer, and uh, you asked. Okay. Zen Buddhism. I already said last night the main thing I wanted to say about Zen. You know, Zen is very critical of ritualistic formalized, me mechanistic dependence upon uh, worshipping, you know, you know Buddha Puj or, or, or statue making, or I mean like image making, or on text recitations. They're very, depend uh, very critical of any kind of what they call dependence on those things. And yet, they bow down in front of images, they pay respect to their abbots, uh, they uh, open their services uh, every morning with uh, chanting sutras and, uh, and call upon manjushri, dedicate themselves to wisdom like from manjushri. Uh, they have a statue, uh, an image of Shakyamuni uh, somewhere in the temple almost always. Uh, the point is 
uh, I'm impressed more and more with how similar Zen and Theravada are. Uh, you know, if you read a Suzuki book and all this sort of no dependence on the scriptures, no dependence upon this, no dependence, you could get the impression that somehow Zen is doing something totally different than the rest of Buddhists. But you could go to a Zen temple uh, and you don't get that impression, you know. What you get with the Zen is an uh, impression that they're trying very hard to be aware that the outward forms of ritual are like the raft that gets you across the river and at some point you have to know that it's time to leave the raft behind to use the traditional Buddhist metaphor, right? Uh, and that's what I hear Theravada too. The first time I came to this temple three and a half years ago, uh, the young Buddhists were meeting out there, the university students, and uh, I was talking to them and the first thing somebody at this temple explained to me, uh, at least uh, this one of the first things I remember, I don't know if it was the very first conversation I had, I don't mean that, but was you know, the first conversation I had with somebody who was not, uh, you know, a monk here, but just an ordinary attendant. They said, well, now remember, we Theravada Buddhists, or we Buddhists, uh, we, you know, we pay respect to the, uh, to the Buddha, but we're not worshiping the Buddha. We don't believe that Buddha is like a god. We believe we have to work out our own salvation. That's what the Zen people mean when they say no dependence upon scriptures and no dependence on images, uh, no dependence upon merit making, you could say, right? And yet they make merit. They're conscious of their need for karma. If I say to them, to a, a Zen monk, now, do you need to, to uh, do good karma? They look at me like, well, of course, you know. Of course I need to, to, to make merit, right, to do good karma. Uh, but I'm not going to do it by having a kind of uh, slavish dependence. I, you know, I'm not going to do it by just uh, saying, well, uh, you know, I chanted three sutras, therefore I made merit. If the mind is not involved, then the merit is not involved. Zen has some problems, too. It's far too institutionalized. Uh, somehow the Japanese love of ritual and formalism has taken over uh, and uh, it, it, to an outsider at least uh, it looks like it's gone too far um, there's, it seems to be too much inward directed and not enough directed toward helping people now the Zen people are marvelous Buddhists uh, don't get me wrong I'm only doing a kind of in-house critique of what, what I see when I'm there right and the same thing they say a lot, too. None of these things I've said to you tonight is different than what I've heard from Buddhists around the world on these topics, right? I mean, not that everybody has said just what I've said uh, in these words, but, they, uh, you know, I'm just sort of giving back to you what I've heard. Okay, I'm, I'm last going to shut up. Thanks for your attention. I think you have accrued a lot of merits today by attending this talk. <laughs> uh, the Buddhist concept of merit is very misunderstood and criticized by various religious groups and certain denominations of Buddhism also. But when you study the Buddha's attitude towards merits, you can understand the real nature or the place for merits in Buddhism. When the Buddha was struggling for gaining his enlightenment, Suddenly, Mara appeared in front of him, then advised him, you are a prince, you have come from a royal family, you can go back and become the king of the country, you can enjoy your life, 
why do you want to suffer like this? At the same time, you also can make a lot of merits. The Mara has given this advice. Now then, what did the Buddha say? He said, Anumattena pipunyena atho mayan navijyati the language spoken by the Buddha at that time, he said, I am not working to gain merits. Merits are not important to me. Merits cannot do anything for me to gain my enlightenment, to experience Nibbani bliss. Who says this? The Buddha. Of course, not yet gain his enlightenment. So here, this interpretation given by the Buddha is sometimes misleading for those who have not learned the real concept of this merit. In simple language, merits are important for us to lead a worldly life, to enjoy worldly life. All these enjoyments means to an end. We cannot find out end of suffering by gaining more and more merit to enjoy our life. With the rebirth, Coexistence take place either as human beings or devas or brahmas. They are not free from worldly sufferings. Merit cannot send us to nirvana in simple language. If we want to attain nirvana, it is necessary for us to drop all our good and bad karmas, merits. We cannot carry our merits to nirvana to enjoy our life. Remember this. If you cling to this belief of concept or belief of uh, good karma or merit, you never gain your final salvation or nibbani bliss. Karma Kshekarat Jnana. After working for his enlightenment, the Buddha gained this knowledge. What is that? Eradicated the ambitions of creating either good karma or bad karma. No more good karma, no more bad karmas or merits. They are not important. To us, they are important because we are thinking we are pilgrims. On the way, for our pocket expenses, we need something. Yes, it is true. But the Buddha's advice is don't lower the real validity of your merits by creating more and more ambitions and craving towards your good karma or merit. You must know how to divert your mind for the spiritual development. Don't cling to worldly pressure. I heard on many occasions some people here in this country announced that Formerly, they were very poor. After becoming Christians, today they are very rich. They have become Christian because of Christianity. They try to influence others in this way. But the Christianity says the difficulty of rich men to go into heaven. Ah, you know the parable. The camels and the eye of the needle going through. 
How can a rich man go to heaven? That means that man missed the heaven, got money, that's all. How they mislead innocent people. In the same way, we Buddhists also try to go to Nirvana through our life. It doesn't work. We have to drop that crazy attitude. Uh, then, when the man is free from all these things, we gain it. Just now, our good friend mentioned what he heard or what he has seen in Thailand. <laughs> well, I think a few weeks ago there was an article either a week or Eastern Economic Review, I cannot remember. In Thailand, group of people purposely come and join the order without receiving the ordination from the higher authority. They themselves shave their head and from the yellow rope and go out and spend for three months. Every day they go begging their food. And they say they can make more money by begging than working outside. Who knows that those people who go out and collect some food and send from the other end are belong to that group. On the other hand, assume they are real monks. After receiving some extra food, if they sell this book, I mean the best uh, food, to buy their medicine. If they are students, by selling this food, they can buy their books. Can you say those monks are bad monks? Therefore, we cannot blame those monks if they are genuine monks. Because monks usually do not go and approach the people, I want to buy this medicine, I want to buy this one. If they get some extra requisite, they can exchange or they can sell and buy what they really need. That liberty is there. So I would like to clarify this. Now, I still got time, you know, I, Mr. Alec Robertson also to speak a few words, about ten minutes. Honorable sirs, <coughs> and my good friend who has just given you the lecture and uh, brothers and sisters we listened to a very instructive and inspiring talk by the professor and we also listened to very illuminate, illuminating comments by our venerable monk uh, venerable Dhammananda Tera. Now as he rightly pointed out we should not merely acquire merit to dana, sila and bhavana. These are the three sources of acquiring merit. That is, the Buddha mentions that they are punyadara, sources of merit in the Anguttara Nikaya, one of the texts of the Pali Canon. Now, it is always said that when you acquire merit, there must be two guiding factors. There is this uh, punya dara that you acquire merit, then there must be panya or wisdom as the venerable monk stress. Because if we merely acquire merit and by that merit what will happen that we will get the good things of life in abundance. We get the surfeit to the good things of life and we'll be, even if we are born in heavenly realms in the celestial realms, we'll be enjoying the good results of that word, of that merit. But that the aspiration, the aim of a Buddhist. Whatever good actions that he does, it must be Nibbana oriented. Because uh, the goal of Buddhism is Nibbana. Therefore, to, to use an English expression, we have to hitch our wagon to the star 
So whatever good actions that we do, we should have that as our target, not the idea of being born into a rich family or wealthy family or to enjoy the good things in heaven or in the Brahma realms, as the Venerable Dhamma and the Tera rightly said. So the merit that Buddhists acquire and accumulate should be guided and directed by Panya. There is this Punya Dara and Jnana Dara. That means these two should go hand in hand. Now another important fact should be borne in mind that if one is merely guided by reason, by logic and by knowledge, then one will be, become only scholastic. That will be dry as dust. The merit that one acquires should lead you to lead a good life. Otherwise, if you merely do try to look at it in the light of reason and merely study it and acquire knowledge, that doesn't serve a purpose. So the merit should go hand in hand with reason and knowledge, and knowledge should also go, go hand in hand with merit then only one will be able to attain Nibbāna. Now that is quite clear in the Buddhist text in Theravāda, in the Theravāda tradition. So we acquire merit. Merit is a thing it is said to give a simple simile so that all of you will be able to understand. 